one of the things that I am uh, well known for is um, I like to think of it as breaking history. Uh, I do a lot of fantasy based illustrations, but I use history as my um, starting point when I'm designing the clothing. I don't just sort of make it up or use previous fantasy. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, uh, previous visual language that's been created by the likes of the Lords of the Rings films or stuff like that. I like to go back to the history myself and build it because the designers for all of these things used history themselves. So rather than using diluted uh, secondhand information, I will use the first-hand information um, that I have discovered for myself. This particular stream, uh, I started researching it earlier, uh, looking to do all of sort of uh, the last about thousand years of fashion, but obviously I discovered that that was quite a large um, jump. So I've actually isolated it to about 200 years of the late medieval period. It's one of my favourite sort of uh, periods to work from because this is the era of the classic knights, princesses, um, the big headdresses, the plate armour, jousting, all that kind of stuff. So it's a sort of period that we all quite enjoy playing in, but I think a lot of people don't necessarily know where to start looking and they might make some of their artwork, as I said, based on secondhand information instead of looking back at the history itself. Uh, my favourite thing to do, of course, is to start by looking at what is real, so what is the real history, um, which I have gathered together several mood boards, which will start, I'm going to start by just going through those and talking about the actual fashion history, uh, and then we'll get into how we break it. The thing I'm going to start with is women's fashion, um, which is this little mood board that I've put together. Now this isn't just like one decade or whatever, there are about at least 100 to 200 years worth of uh, fashion jumps here. There's also different places, some of this is Italian, some of this is English, some of this is other Central European. Um, I haven't really isolated it to any specific area, I just went through and went, I like that, no I like that too. And that's how I would work when I was putting together design work for something new is I would simply go and look at the history and decide what was appealing to me. Because we're talking about the history in general, I've kind of not had any specific character in mind when I picked these. I just was picking a sort of general appearance of things. And I had notes somewhere. There they are. So as I said, you cannot break what you don't know. And one of the first things I will do is just look at the stuff, look at the shapes of things. Um, the main piece of fashion at the time was uh, what we might call a dress, but it's known as a kirtle, which does go back further than this. But this particular era is where the kirtle started to become more constructed. This is just pre having a separate undergarment that had bones in it, like stays uh, bodies, which would later become the corset. So the actual dress themselves, the kirtle itself, would be reinforced with boning or reeds or um, a variety of things. It wouldn't necessarily be the whalebone or the steel that would be known later on in the Victorian period. So you can see certain garments such as this one here, which is from prior attire. She is a, a historical dressmaker based in the UK. Uh, this is a lot more constructed. You can actually see, if you look closely, the lines of all the boning from the garment here. So you can actually see all these marks, which don't necessarily matter, but do, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter. What I mean is that you know how it's constructed, but I find it helps me know. Uh, and then you can get some really cool details if you are drawing them. Uh, this is a much later 
design. The earlier designs um, are something like this that has a lot less of the boning involved. This is a lot more naturally formed around the body. This is Morgan Donna, who is another YouTuber and dressmaker, although she doesn't sell what she makes. Um, you see it in paintings. This is a contemporary, a contemporary painting of the era. Um, and obviously these can get quite fancy. Like here from this painting, you get a lot of embroidery and additions, and obviously these are rich people. But this particular dress type was worn by all classes of people. It wasn't a, um, a rich item or a poor item, it just depended on what it was made of. Um, things like uh, silks was obviously the rich ladies. But this style, for instance, might be your more um, middle class type lady. She's still got some some trimming on there, but it's not made of um, a, a rich, impractical material like silk. It's more practical because it's wool, so it's warm. Uh, and then uh, did I have one over here somewhere? I don't know I've got a lot of reference images on here. Um, then we look at some of the Italian styles as well, which slightly later, but they often have a lot more frills and poofs and the like. Because the Italian Renaissance loved those kind of shapes. And if you notice, all the kirtles really are there sleeveless. They just have two straps at the top, which obviously is reminiscent of later bodies and corsets. Um, so quite often sleeves would be an added item such as here they could be detached uh, and you could change colors lots of different things you could change them uh, you might not wear them at all in summer in winter you might wear heavier ones uh, this is where we get these fancy italian detachable ones with all the extra frills uh, you can see here with uh, the velvet style this is the later tudor style um, and then obviously sometimes you did get the much later styles, you start to end up with the sleeves actually attached to the gown itself. And in comparison to a modern dress of a similar shape with two shoulder straps, it sits a lot wider across the shoulder. Um, they don't quite sit where a modern dress would, which might be more here. Uh, it is a much wider style and this does restrict the actual movement of the shoulder of the person who is wearing it but as we know that women in history this was not so much of a concern. Um, the other thing to note, uh, I've got one of Morgan Donner's mock-ups sitting here. Uh, the top of uh, the kirtle, the bodice part, um, came down to the natural waist so without a skirt attached it is actually quite um it's quite cropped we might refer to this as kind of a a crop top or whatever the skirt would then be sort of attached from here and then this is something that we can use if we are doing fantasy or fashion illustration because uh, we can add we can use it just as a crop top and not add the skirt at all. Uh, I've just noticed that the stream is having some problems, so I'm going to pause here and return in a moment. Alright, so I am back. The stream is now not working at all, so we are recording this as if I was live on stream, and then I will release it on YouTube later. I might do it like a YouTube premiere so that you can watch along and comment. I don't know. We'll get to that. I will figure that out when we get there. Um, and I will pick up where I left off and proceed with the historical costume lecture, um, which is what I feel like I'm doing. It's not really a lecture. I'm not an expert. This is just all uh, accrued information. Uh, so yeah, that was the uh, whistle stop tour of the uh, women's fashion. Now, 
when it comes to designing fantasy outfits, we don't have to just stick with women's fashion for women and men's fashion for men. We can start mixing things up and the like. Um, so while later I will be sketching using this lovely figure in the middle right here. Uh, so I will be doing a piece of women's fashion. Um, we're going to move on to look at some of the men's, sorry, men's fashion of the era. Um, Again, we are talking quite a large uh, breadth here of fashion. Uh, some of these pictures are from the Tudors TV show, which are not fully accurate. Uh, I will probably explain why in a moment. Because um, men's fashion, especially when it comes to the contemporary representation, we like to switch things up and the like because um, people are used to seeing uh, sexy men wearing suits. And the suit was not a fashion statement for at least another 200 years. I can't quite remember the exact date when the first thing we might refer to as a suit arrived. But at this point, that's not it. So they often add extra strange details to try and appeal and make these historical figures sexy to the modern female viewer or other male, whatever. But the, to the to the contemporary viewer uh, that is reading this. Uh, let me get my notes back out. Um, oh, that was one thing that I did miss with the women is the chemise or the shift, which is worn underneath all garments because your outer garments were not washed as often because they were made of more expensive materials or they might have been your only, only garment to wear and they didn't wash as easily so people wore a linen undershirt uh, underneath everything because this could be washed easily it could be produced a lot cheaper so you could have multiple of them and switch them out every day similar to we uh, that we do now to our own underwear hopefully um and this is one thing that i often enjoy to add to a lot of my fantasy designs is a shift. Uh, for some reason my Clip Studio has decided to try and auto save this so I can't do anything at the moment. Come on. Um, but yeah let's carry on. Um, the shift. So sometimes you see in some TV programs and the like, uh, especially to make it sexy, especially when women are involved, is a laced up garment without a shift underneath so you can just see straight through to skin and it does make me cringe slightly not because of historical accuracy or other things that might make certain uh, historical costumers or the like cringe it's more because that is just uncomfortable because a lot of these garments were not the most comfortable thing to wear directly beside your skin you wanted the nice um chemise shift whatever underneath because that was the softer um, garments to wear. Um, so again when it comes to fantasy garments uh, you don't have to stick to just the white. That's one of the things that I use to switch up my designs quite a lot is by changing the colour of the shift, changing the shape, uh, adding some more modern shapes and the like in there. Uh, that's something that can be done um, looking at what kind of shirts we wear now because it's a it is a garment that goes back over thousands of years does the basic white shirt so this will be i lesson i know less about men's garments but i do know some um the main item was the tunic or doublet depending on what era we're looking at and that is the thing that's worn on the top then there are the hose, which is where we get things like Robin Hood men in tights, where we get these lovely sexy man legs out. And then for Tudor men as well, uh, we had these little puffy items, and I cannot for the life of me remember the name of them. Uh, but obviously we've, we've all seen the cartoons, that is an item, one that is not often recreated in the modern uh, depictions. As you can see here from these Tudor representations, uh, where have it gone? They've tried very hard here to make these items 
uh, much more smooth and to more appealing to the modern eye. And going back to that modern idea, men did not wear boots. They did uh, they wore boots, but when they were riding, and they did not wear them on a day to day basis. They wore shoes. Uh, as you can see from the contemporary paintings, such as here, here you've got shoes worn over things because they wanted to show off their lovely, shapely calves to other men and to women to show how fit they were or otherwise. The legs were a big deal in the men's costumes. And the other thing that was pointed out to me earlier today that I didn't even notice uh, is that Henry VIII made the codpiece quite um, uh, popular and that has been completely ignored in the Tudors TV show, which is about Henry VIII. So clearly that is uh, something that the contemporary costume designers has decided is uh, very not sexy. Let's get rid of these markings. So yeah, you'll get tunics of varying lengths, often depending on your uh, how fashionable you were or how rich you were. Uh, perhaps if you were going about your day-to-day -day life as a farm worker, you wouldn't necessarily be having fancy short clothing. You would want something more protective. Um, you might even be somebody who maybe wore boots if you were trudging about the mud in the field. Um, and uh, certain more religious figures... Uh, would be wearing longer robes for modesty because they would not be showing off their legs, but it wouldn't be trousers as we currently know them. It would be the woolen hose which were cut to fit. And again, we see some of the same uh, fashion things that we see in the women's with these puffy bits on the sleeves. Uh, that's a more Italian based gown. Um, or you get these big shoulders because Tudor men loved this big shape um, with these outer jackets. The wider you were, the better. I don't know what people um, mean when they laugh at Victorian women when this existed first. Um, you would often get uh, cloaks and capes as outerwear to stay warm. Uh, and obviously Henry VIII himself was known for these big silhouettes. Uh, and again here, it's not quite as big on Tudor's Henry, I think they've just tried to make him that little bit more appealing uh, and less historically accurate, which is fair enough. You know, I'm about to uh, design some things that are based on contemporary appeal. We're not necessarily here to be historically accurate. I'm not making a historically accurate uh, character. I'm looking more at the fantasy side of things. Um, and obviously the other part of men's fashion was the armour, which for some men would have been worn to events and things that were just social, uh, but the more, uh, the more it became this full plate armour, which is the late medieval, not early medieval, um, the less men would wear it to events and the like. It would just be for showing off your martial prowess. Uh, now, Sometimes people get confused, and we see depictions of uh, early medieval wearing full plate armour. Uh, that is not the case. This is very uh, late medieval when the military technology was able to almost encase a man entirely in metal. And they were quite flexible and quite manoeuvrable. Uh, again, there were layers that were worn underneath this. Uh, it wasn't really padded. It was just... A garment to wear underneath to, so the metal wouldn't dig directly into your skin. Often it had small patches of uh, chainmail in the vulnerable places. I don't actually have a photograph of the item, uh, but often you would find your undergarment had patches of chainmail in places such as here and here and around here, which is where the holes in the armour are. And obviously you don't want to get stabbed in the area that has a hole. So uh, the other item of armour that was quite common is this item here. This is a gambeson. It is not worn underneath the armour. It is thick and padded and it is armour in its own right. It's got about 20 plus layers of material, so it is actually quite difficult to stab someone through it or catch an arrow through it. It's quite protective. This is what someone who's maybe not a knight, but your more middle class 
fighting gentleman might be wearing. Uh, your poor gentleman probably couldn't afford any armour at all. Um, but if you're a man of some wealth, you could probably afford a padded gambeson. And the last thing I think that I've got to talk about in this bit is the surcoat, which is how you signified to other knights who you were. So they often had designs on them that uh, matched your house so that on the battlefield people would know whose side you were fighting for so they didn't try and kill you if you were on their side. Um, or at tournaments to look spectacular and fantastic. And these, again, to the modern eye, might look a lot like dresses because they often had... Uh, where have I gone here? They would often have a lot of folds um, in the bottom to allow for extra manoeuvrability. But, again, this was a very, at the time, masculine item. And the other thing you'll notice is a lot of the men are wearing belts, and quite often they have a knife or something hung from the belt. Uh, for women this was true as well. Most people carried a small pocket knife. Um, swords as well were quite often worn just around in day-to-day -day life. Not an absolutely massive sword, but some of the smaller swords we see and it's less that men fought with them, but more that you just wore it like a fashion thing to have because you were rich and it showed that you could afford a sword because not everyone could afford one of those. Um, I'm not going to go into detail as to how suits of armour are made up. I am, I know enough about it to draw it, but I am not, um, not an expert. So that's something that you can look up yourself. Um, but yeah, this late medieval is when all these shapes come in. Oh, that last point. Um, you get a lot of this uh, shape that if someone was to accurately portray this in a contemporary film about knights and use this big curved shape that we see and dipped in at the waist, you would probably get a lot of people saying, oh, they've tried to make it feminine or, you know, they're ruining it or they would make armor like this that may be for a woman to wear but this is completely true this helped deflect blows away from the chest area which obviously contains a lot of vital organs so having this big puffed out bit that would then dip away allowed uh, blows to be deflected and it happens to look quite feminine so or to modernise, it happens to look quite feminine. I am sure at the time it was the height of masculinity. Uh, you also get lovely designs such as this on the back of rich armours that again follow this contemporary idea of hourglass femininity. But again, these little ridges were expensive, so it was just about showing off how much money you had. Uh, because if you could not only afford armour, but could afford all these little details, you were definitely rich. And on top of that, we have these engraving details, which were done more in the late medieval because they had the technology to do it. So again, you're talking very rich if you've got a suit of armour that looks like this, and probably a suit of armour you didn't wear very much. I've seen in museums quite a lot of these suits of armour, and there's not very much evidence of them being worn either for tournaments or for battle. They seem to be an item that you own and you wear uh, to social functions to show people, again, how much money you had so that you could not only afford a suit of armour, you could not only afford to get it engraved, but you could afford to not even bother to wear it into battle. That's how, you know, that's how you rich you were. Um, it's quite ridiculous, really. So the last bit that I've got here is our contemporary fashion items uh, that were probably not directly inspired by my medieval, but they have uh, enduring shapes that come from there. Although some of them might have been directly inspired by, but they contain shapes that clearly we still find attractive, either from the men's, such as the swooping shoulders off here. This would be not found in women's gowns. Um, then you've got the classic pinafore dress that goes on top of a t-shirt or a blouse or something like that. 
we've got these big square necklines that we can find here and such as here again pushing the straps further off the shoulder than might normally be seen in contemporary dresses um we've got poofy sleeves going on uh, from chemise shapes and the like which is very reminiscent of some of the italian things uh, again here you've got this shape with a little bit of a poof going on here uh, Again, these are shapes that we all seem to enjoy even now. Uh, big sleeves, pointy shoulders, which you would get that shape from the Italian gowns with the sleeves. So yeah, it's not something that's gone away. Uh, again, this is these are kind of things that I might put on my mood board to inspire me as to how uh, contemporary people view medieval things and all the kind of contemporary technologies and things that I could put into a design that aren't necessarily medieval accurate. Right, so you've probably noticed this uh, delightful figure who I have in the middle of my screen. Uh, to quote Blue Peter, Here's one I made earlier. So this is the figure of the character that I'm going to do some design work on while I explain what I'm thinking. I won't be completing things, this will just be sketch work. And I've got a small list of uh, different types of uh, things that might appear if you were designing a Dungeons and Dragons type character or that kind of thing, because this particular style of character design for me is the kind of thing that suits um, my Dungeons and Dragons type things rather than my uh, like comic style work. Uh, this is the type of character where I would be going extravagant or over the top to make a really cool image, but maybe the costume isn't something that I would want to draw moving about a comic. It's slightly less practical or something like that, but it looks kind of cool and that's why I'm making it. Um, I have some examples of designs that I've done uh, that had influence from this specific era. Um, again, we've got sort of medieval sleeves here, a bit of armour. What's this one? Uh, we've got a vampire here who has um, medieval hairstyle and the kind of belt situation as well as some of the shape but not all of um, again, we've got some armour over a sort of chemise dress type shirt. Uh, this one has also some influences from uh, Indian shapes as well, but she's got a medieval um, headdress, slightly medieval shape, but then a bit of influence from other things. Uh, this one is fairly obvious. She's got the sort of kirtle top, but I've given her a separate style skirt that's a lot more uh, Victorian in shape. But again, I've put in the purple for the undergarments rather than the white. I find the white quite boring because very historically accurate. Here we've got the armour that's all gold trimmed. Uh, here again we've got armour with a slightly older style surcoat because it's longer. But the armour is quite modern. And again, you can see here I've got the poofy shoulder uh, from the Italian style gowns. Uh, Again, if this was real armour, you'd probably have your elbows protected and things like that, but going for something that looks kind of cool. Uh, uh, we saving again. But yeah, uh, often with the armour, I leave off parts or whatever in order to make a good looking image, because sometimes just covering, for instance, this one uh, completely in gold, you get quite a dull image. So I allow some of the white chemise to shine through. Uh, this is a lot more historically accurate. Um, this character is uh, a cook of some kind, so she's got the more um, traditional kirtle dress going on, but I've given her open shoulders and obviously a black chemise. Uh, here I've separated the bodice from the skirt, but we've got little bits of the Italian. We've got some earlier period hair. This is uh, not 15th, 14th or 15th century. This is more ninth century uh, we're a few hundred years out but again the wonder of fantasy is I can do that uh, again we've got the big male shape here 
uh, small shoes rather than big boots. Although there's nothing stopping you putting boots on fantasy characters. Um, again, it's not historically accurate. You do you. Um, here we've got the dip in from the armour. A little bit of the Italian style shoulders. Uh, not full armour. Italian style again underneath. But a little bit more Roman actually in the skirt. We've got the side laced kirtle. Because kirtles could be laced at the front, the sides or the back, and that often depended on whether you had help or not to lace them. Uh, again, we've got this poofy style going on, also the much more slim skirt. We've got half a top going on, half a chemise, you know, a bit of fun. And this is the more design work that I would use uh, for my historical fantasy style comic. It's a lot less fantastical and a lot more practical, which sometimes is less fun, but when you've got to draw this every panel, you want something more concise and repeatable. So yeah, it's a whistle stop tour through things I've already drawn. And then we're going to go back to that figure here. So I'm going to pick one off of the here. Uh, I'm going to pick one of the classes off something that I found earlier. So if we're looking at somebody, for instance, who is, let's go for the top of the list, sharpshooter, you are looking at the type of character who's possibly hiding for long periods of time uh, and possibly a little bit arrogant. I don't know. The personality of your individual character will you know, reflect, but from a practical point of view, You've got someone who knows they can make the shot. You've got someone who's possibly sitting around for hours at a time. So they might not wear something so boned. So you might be looking for more of the masculine style and maybe less of the big skirt. So this is where I might think we want this shoulder shape, which is well known for the time. But maybe we just want the straps. We don't want any of the Italian constricting style. And maybe we want short and out the way. Or maybe she is a sharpshooter with a bow and arrow, in which case you will want some lower arm protection. Uh, let's make a decision. Um, well, let's go with guns, because that's definitely not historically accurate. So if we're going for a character that is wielding a gun instead of a bow and arrow, we could go for something maybe short and poofy just at the top here. And but maybe because she's sitting around for a while, she might be wearing one of these big poofy Tudor jackets to keep her warm. So yeah, it doesn't mean uh, there is not a problem with uh, drawing it and then erasing. This is how a lot of my design work happens. So then you'll probably also want this chemise shape. So perhaps this poof just comes down here. Let's bring up the this one again. So if we're looking at this and going by this, perhaps she's wearing the thin legged hose rather than a long skirt. Again, practicality and some nice little pointy shoes and a lot of these styles have this belted waist and a little mini skirt but because this is fantasy we're not going to keep it flat a lot of um what makes a lot of interest to me is a little bit of asymmetry it's not something that we see a lot in our day-to-day -day garments so it can be something that uh, signifies that this is not something from contemporary life but from fantasy so I've pulled in this here 
and then we're going to keep adding how does this shape work uh, so yeah that's what the references are for as well is that I will look to see how the shape works and then once I've got this going on uh, I might start to look at it and go this maybe looks a little bit too historically accurate so I might look at how I could change that to be a little bit more contemporary fashionable uh, I might draw from a different historical era and put a little bit of poof at her elbow or I might uh, just bring the poof up the top like I had when I just had a bit of the chemise out and then she's got her arms out uh, I might add detachable sleeves and then I might look at how the bodice is decorated uh, so I might go for this front closure which has spiral lacing to give some kind of detail for the eyes in the middle and some kind of trimming detail which then might also appear round the skirt so you can see how building up the designs little bit by little bit and obviously if we're looking at some kind of uh, gunslinger sharpshooter we're looking at where the guns are kept uh, you would then need to probably do research as to what kind of gun are you going historical is this a bit more sci-fi um, I'm just going to draw rough pistol handles which are from a couple of about 100 200 years after this but again we are in fantasy land we can do whatever we like there are as I pointed out some of my designs where I've got elements from uh, a thousand years apart contemporary elements as well as historical elements from the Victorian medieval etc all smooshed into one image and this is partly because I have quite a breadth of knowledge of fashion history but it is something that I will pull upon I don't always need the reference images there I will usually pick one period as the dominant fashion period so in this case it is late medieval but that's not to say that I might not pull in from other bits for small details because the closer you stick to the historical accuracy the more people get upset when it's not right I've discovered whereas the more historical fantasy you go the more people are willing to just sit back and go actually that's kind of cool so again we might have some lacing detail down here because these might be made of something more durable like a leather um, not a shiny leather which again you see wonderfully down here in the Tudors they did not wander around in black shiny leather that's just attempting to make Henry VIII look like some kind of biker dude so yeah I might have here some kind of shooter uh, if I didn't have the guns hung here we might again despite drawing it earlier we might have somebody's hand out here holding this is badly drawn uh, fingers out front holding some kind of more advanced sniper style thing and again she's a practical lady so we would probably avoid excessive jewellery and she might have her hair in a more practical style you don't always need to go overboard with your designs 
uh, you don't always need super fancy hair to match because everything as part of this outfit matches who she is as a person and again depending on what kind of sharpshooter uh, you are drawing they could be somebody who is very good so they might have a lot of money in which case when it comes to coloring this you might be using richer colors more embroidery that kind of thing whereas if they weren't very good at it they might not even be wearing anything this opulent you don't always need to highlight traditional feminine shapes either it's your fantasy designs you can do whatever you like which i think is the motto of this entire session so yeah here i've got this character she's wearing tudor men style jacket over this top with detachable sleeves comfy hose shoes a bit of the tunic bottom going on there practical hairstyle guns sharpshooter tick so again if we're looking at perhaps at somebody more um magical uh we're looking potentially at more religious garments in history which were longer and uh, less uh, showing off because the traditional mage or whatever is usually seen as someone who follows some kind of magical religion that would depend on you and your depiction of your character of course but say we're going for this elementalist which is second on the list so you know let's stick there so let's maybe go for something more female in design and we're talking quite a fancy sounding job she's an elementalist she's not just a witch or a mage or whatever so she might be somebody that works at a court or perhaps is for hire to do certain things making more money so going for these big shapes and another thing to look at here it's less obvious uh, let me duplicate that layer so i can uh, de-arm this figure one of the things you might look at when character designing is what shape the clothes themselves make uh, they talk a lot when you're doing character design about um, making the actual figure have a certain shape you've seen the classic where somebody will draw like the dude with the big chest and they'll draw um, certain hairstyles that are really big or whatever because they talk about the silhouette but the silhouette can also come from this we can get nice big sleeves and you've got this big sloping neck again you see it down here in this reference and obviously I've exaggerated there um, but if she has her hands down in perhaps a more mage-like way you can pull this big sort of sloping shape which is a lot more regal looking uh, than uh, uh, it's a lot more um you might trust this person you, you know she looks like she knows what she's doing she's got a presence because she's wearing big clothes big clothes big person so a bit like this example over here we might go for some big sleeves now this is the painting now this is a recreation up top that someone has done of this dress and you can actually see how dramatically the shoulders can get in some of these gowns so we can go quite quite big oh we're saving again i wonder if i do like this auto save but it does interrupt the flow so yeah we can go quite wide because these dresses often weren't low although you can go low it's fantasy do what you like but we might go for a nice big neck and some of these had the big high necked chemises which we could add 
perhaps it's a dark color. And we're pulling in the top here. Now this is a slightly later style because the waist has started to go upwards a little bit, which it did for a while. It sits slightly higher than the natural waist, which exaggerates the width of the shoulders and all that kind of thing. But then instead of perhaps doing the wide skirt, we might go for something narrow. And then perhaps in classic sort of sexy styling, we might add a gap in the side to show off either a leg or another skirt. Could be a gap showing dark skirt. I quite like that. Again, that is something that I enjoy bringing in some of these. Uh, where's my drawing gone? I moved something and then it moved everything else. So yeah, starting to bring in maybe more contemporary fashion or fantasy elements by having like these gaps in the sides that uh, allow, in this case, the sort of dark chemise to show through. And perhaps we've got this big here. Perhaps that's too big, let's take that away. And because she's specifically an elementalist, we might have uh, necklace designs that have, uh, my pen's too clunky for this, the four uh, classic alchemy shapes, again, sitting low on the shoulders decoratively, which is less seen here, actually, because you've got these kind of necklaces and the like, but is more seen on the masculine designs. You get these sort of big heavy metal chains and that's something that I would bring in to this elementalist design is a big metal chain that I might add sort of alchemy metal symbols and pulling the skirt in and again depending on how much money she had you might want to look at adding some embroidery down here and this is where your personal choices for your character come in because if they've got um, money they might have this kind of thing and if they don't clearly they won't and this is the kind of character that might have um, again drawing from this Italian shape, they have this more drawn updo, which would allow this elegant shape to go in at the neck and then back out around the head. Now this could be hair, it could be a headpiece, it could be a crown, uh, you could be going for a witch hat style shape. Uh, this particular, well not live stream because I'm not live, this kind of live video thing that I'm doing is not concentrated on the hairstyles so much. So I haven't got all the references that I might want. Uh, and again, you could pull something from an earlier period because this style of a hair box shape would not fit, but you know, it's a lot more modest perhaps than this style of elementalist would be because it covers the hair and the head. So again, but I like the shape. So we might go for something with the hair. And this is a more 1940s, like victory roll style. But perhaps we've got some jewellery across the forehead, which not very historically accurate, very 
very very rarely did we wear jewelry across our forehead but it seems to be something that most historical dramas throw in but i'm going to throw it in there because i want to so we might have her with big gold shaped things and this is where when it comes to decoration i like to think sometimes as jewellery as sometimes the magical object of the character so it's a way for them to focus without having a magic wand or whatever that you might find in classic styles you can enchant certain items and you find that in Skyrim and other fantasy games some of these things so again we might have some kind of wrist jewellery fun dangly bits totally not historically accurate then i would possibly add some of the gold into this embroidery at the bottom don't know why i've cut the dress short now if we're going quite dramatic i could take this dress design and add um big trained elements uh this is a lot more victorian in style things of this period might have been longer at the back but you wouldn't necessarily have got this big heavy train but that's kind of fun to add that shape but having said that it pulls it into 1830 style which that also had this big sleeve shape so i might go back and take that away uh, there we go and bring it back to this style and again the more i work on it the more detail would appear possibly once i'd picked a color if you're going for the dark chemise and the up hair and so it's the yellow garden there you go decoration again you can pull in perhaps she's got dangling things which doesn't work as well because actually that takes away from this hourglass thing perhaps the chemise is held together at the top by some decoration perhaps there's more chains going on because I'm exaggerating the width of her shoulders again a little bit like the masculine uh, clothing of the time to sort of show power and she's an elementalist so she's got a lot of power probably who knows but yeah this particular one does this character that I'm just sort of making up on the spot and then perhaps we'll do somebody a little bit more um fighter base maybe a knight maybe the warlord next all right so let's go we've done someone quite grand and we've done someone perhaps a little bit more down to earth so let's go for some armor I like the idea of the warlord actually so again we're looking for a big presence but we've got armor involved so if we're looking at the idea that this is some kind of lordly character but they're a fighter we are probably looking at some armor that is practical yet possibly fancier looking but not as fancy as maybe the engraved armor um although it depends how much money they've got and are willing to throw away on some armor so let's pick up the armor so yeah we definitely wouldn't be looking at this padded gambeson that is too cheap for a warlord and so what we're looking really at is getting this shape and because it's feminine as well let's go for this shape i talked about 
earlier. I had this. Uh, oh, that's wrong. Let's erase that. Let's bring in some of this shape from here. And then some of the deflection. Because you don't want it just to dip in the middle and then have the breastplate disappear because your blow would just clance off and then cut the person on the hips. Now, this is where it gets difficult with a pose such as the one that I've done because armour is solid and this figure is quite flexible. So, uh, this is where some knowledge of construction and things comes in. So, you're not just blindly following the shape. I follow quite a lot of creators on YouTube who recreate uh, more the dresses and the fabric constructions than the knights and the armour, but there's again content for that as well. So the more you know, the more you can follow. So we're probably looking at someone again who's got the sort of big shoulder shape, but I'm going to add this asymmetric style of shoulder, but then um, am I going to add, oh I don't know, I don't want to go just drawing a suit of armour, which seems to be what I'm currently doing. So if we've got this set up. We want to then break it and look fantastical. And if anyone's seen The Witcher, the uh, Queen Calanthe, she has the most fantastic queenly armour uh, that she wanders around. It's very practical, but very regal, but also feminine in a way that doesn't make her look girly. She's very grown up and you would not want to come up against her in battle. So yeah, this is maybe where you see some of this chainmail layering coming in. I might want to add some of that into the shape. And again, this is where I'm starting to break the armour because some of these designs might not be practical if you are physically wearing the armour. It might not be the best way to deflect a blow or something like that. but that's not necessarily what I'm concerned with. So maybe we've got this layered and maybe instead of going for big shoulders, we might go for big skirt. Because if someone is in charge, she might not be on the front line, but she might be sitting on a throne screaming things to her generals and underlings. So you might end up with more of the skirt situation, which, to be honest with you, for this period is not particularly exciting. It's pretty standard uh, construction. It is what's called a rectangle skirt, um, which is where you sew your material into a long loop and then you add pleats along the top, which give your skirt this shape, but it's pleated up and down and it sits over the hip spring. It's a very simple skirt to make. We still wear them nowadays. Less so because it does use a lot of material around the top that could be cut off. But it's a very simple construction which, considering at this time all garments were sewn by hand, the ease of construction uh, and using every scrap of fabric was important. Um, You'll see the difference with, say, a circle skirt, which is a more contemporary construction, is you would only get folds from the bottom, but they would disappear at the top because the fabric is taken away. This is less known of this time period, so if you were to draw something that had less folds at the top, you might end up with something that sort of takes people away from the era you're necessarily trying to depict. And we are saving again. Come on, I want to draw things. Stop doing the auto saving. It's because I've got such a big document. I have uh, so many reference images in this. I have so many layers and I don't normally work like this. So I think my computer is having a little bit of a 
what are you doing kind of paddy at me there we go so yeah if we are again covering the bottom here and I've got part of the design that is coming from over the armour uh, under the armour but over the chain mail and then a bit here that is under the chain mail perhaps in a different colour and ooh, let's see we could do a split right down the middle that could look really cool so yeah this is my favourite part of any design process is designing how the garments and such will be put together how I'm representing this character I've gone for big skirt and again I might start changing the angle of the chainmail to a slight diagonal but I feel like one on top one underneath is perhaps too much you could have a second skirt over the top and it could be the whole skirt with a split in it which uh, the actual split skirt itself didn't start to appear until I after Henry's time not not much later but the the Tudors Elizabeth and the like who also wore big shoulders because she was the queen and she wanted people to know so she adopted some of these masculine styles into her um, own clothing because the women tended not to have such big shoulders so here we've got more of um, I don't know if you're watching uh, the say yes to the dress but we've got more of a fit and flare thing going on here because the armour is covering the skirt and she's got two skirts which is quite common that was worn multiple skirts one on top of the other of many different colours you would hitch one up to show off a different colour that again was layering to keep warm and maybe we have another layer that's a little bit more a little bit later styling uh, let's pick a colour so I can sort of see how that would go so maybe we have a layer that comes from underneath the top uh, no that brings it far too late in styling I don't want that uh, undo 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 so you know, we've got the armor here now if we've gone for a less practical bottom part we can start maybe to remove some of this shoulder stuff and perhaps use this style more as a um, fashion piece metal corset style perhaps not actually being used as a corset but exaggerating the feminine curves which at the time as I said this armour wouldn't have been feminine this would have just been practical perhaps even we want to start shaping the top of the armour into that straight cut which would be seen in the female dresses so using such an aggressive item with such feminine design points could be quite fun actually I'm quite enjoying that and I'm trying to avoid doing floofy shoulders again although that was a design factor of the era so if we've got maybe a poofy chemise because you know rich poofy lots of material around the neck and some armor pieces on the shoulder And then where is 
the original figure with the arms. That's too much. Let's go back to the armless figure. So again, when you're doing outfit design, you don't necessarily want to obscure the body with hands doing anything too crazy. You actually want to show off the design of your outfit, either so you can show off to your other players what your character is wearing or uh, to another artist who might be drawing them for you or just to generally show what they're up to. So here I've got the top of the plate and like with this bottom bit we're going to bring this design uh, all the material out from under the plate and gather it at the wrists. So making it big rather than at the shoulders, uh, slightly further down on the arms. And perhaps if we're talking warlord, she wouldn't be grinning so much like a loon. She would be aggressive and powerful and perhaps wearing armour pieces like gloves if she is someone to be followed but not necessarily someone who is at the front of the battlefield herself she would be wearing all these items to remind of her prowess but not necessarily to take part perhaps we might pull hair from something modern and punkish rather than historical. So yeah, pulling from the armour side of things, we've pulled more of a skirt into it. Uh, I wouldn't want necessarily to go into battle wearing this, but if we're looking at the Lord sword slash war lady aspect, We've got someone who wants to be an imposing pre uh, presence inside a hall or something like that. So you would have these layers of material that show off the wealth. Um, possibly we'd have this dark layer up top as well. And then this uh, yellow layer, if I could get the right colour appearing as well. And then possibly even a, a third colour. So maybe even another layer. That's too thin to see. So we possibly get another layer as well as the chain mail and things. Perhaps that's the lining colour. But yes, some of these accent colours peeking in and out it's in her hair sort of show off that this is someone powerful and to be obeyed and yeah just as I said I've broken the armour because her neck is exposed she's only got the shoulders and the hips on she's clearly not going to be running or fighting anywhere um, I haven't given her a sword because I feel like having a sword belt or whatever would take away from this aesthetic that I've got but again that's something you could think about um, perhaps, in fact, she is carrying said sword with her off hand. So perhaps she's left handed because that's one thing I forget all the time. Oh, I'll just put the sword here, and then you have to think, oh, maybe they're left handed. So, this is something that I could look at. Uh, I'm just going for the sake of it to flip the entire canvas. And then my computer's going to freak out about it. There we go. Which typically when you flip things, it's got this going on. But that puts the uh, sword right into her right hand. Oh, we're saving again. Uh, so yeah, it puts the sword into her right hand if that's something that you prefer. Um, but no, let's go for... I shouldn't have flipped the entire canvas. I've got too many things going on here. It's uh, too many layers to flip it and then I've got them done it. But yeah, 
I might want to make a right-handed, left-handed. Uh, that might be something that appears in your character design process. Um, because as I said, this is more putting outfits on your characters to support who they are. Um, I'm going to actually flip it back, which is going to make my computer freak out again. Um, because there's a lot of, uh, I mean, I'm sure you're all quite aware of the law of right-handed and left-handed. Children up until recently were made to use their right hands, whether they were left-handed or not, because it was believed that it was wrong to use your left hand. We've got um, sinister uh, comes from the Latin, which I don't know the exact Latin word, but you've got sinister, which means left or sinistra. Uh, so someone that is left-handed is usually seen to have the devil on their left shoulder. You, If you write with your left hand, it's the devil hand. There's all these horrible connections, but it is something that you can add in perhaps if your character is actually evil or something like that. Maybe they're left-handed, maybe these, these little coded things that you can throw in there. Um, I'm actually going to pause this recording until my computer's back with me so that I don't have to just sit here and blabble at you about left-handed things. Let's... oh no, it's back. Let's undo that and probably freak it out just as much. All right, so we have flipped back and that's where I'm going to leave this particular warlord design. Um, now, all three of these have been quite covered up, actually, um, which is the more historical way of doing things. So if you are on a more historical, accurate fantasy adventure, that might be what you're going for. But uh, let's take alchemist and let's go for something uh experimental styly now uh new layer all right alchemist let's go back to the women's inspiration sheet and this thing at the bottom i've got with just the bodice from uh, morgan donna's mock-up of her own garment so I think I mentioned earlier that that reminds me quite a lot in height of the contemporary crop top, which usually does in fact sit at the natural waist. So if we start here and then you could either go here and go long skirt with a gap or we could go trousers, we could go you know, rebel girl. Uh, I could think about who this alchemist is. Perhaps she's a little bit more of a fantasy punk style. So perhaps this is one of the things where we go, maybe she's not wearing a chemise or maybe she's wearing a chemise that is cut out at the shoulders. And perhaps it is laced at a jaunty angle depending on how that looks aesthetically uh, this is why I cut half of one off so maybe she's got one half of the chemise and not the second half so we've got a crazy lady who thinks she can turn lead into gold so perhaps we've got some kind of cool poofy situation going on on the right Actually, no, I'll put that on the left. So yeah, maybe we've got like a one sleeve jobby going on. It's so one big dramatic poofy sleeve. And then we'd have nothing down her right arm. She might wear. Oh, she's an alchemist, so she might be wearing some kind of glasses or in kind of plague dot style, not with the big peak, but some kind of mask situation so she doesn't breathe in. Which is actually quite fun considering she's got her whole arm exposed. Uh, 
Maybe you've got some feathery things going on. I don't know. Sometimes I play with the shape and go, I quite like that shape. And then I don't know what to put in it. Well, let's, let's keep it quite simple there. So if she's messing around, she might be wearing some kind of... We're saving again. I should really merge some of these layers. Yeah, maybe she is wearing some kind of protective apron, so instead of having her stomach out, she could have a more high-waisted thing going on with some kind of leathery apron that might be thicker, although from a lot of um, people who talk about history, leather is not as durable as we think it is sometimes. But blacksmiths would often wear thick leather aprons, so we might have that going on. And then, because it's funny, she might have... No, she's not, it's too funny. No. Let's leave the uh, big men's floofy shorts alone. Might be something that uh, appears in a future design, but unlikely. So yeah, let's figure out the shape of this leather apron. Are we going traditional? Because I quite liked that low cut on the hip, unfortunately. So yeah, let's go for kind of from there. Perhaps that is dark chemise. I intended to get our legs out, but I keep falling into the same patterns because I quite like lots of flowing material. Let's make this more like some kind of work belt. I think I've talked about before in my... Uh, when I sort of talk about myself drawing, I sketch very loosely. I can fix all of this later as long as I understand design-wise what's going on. And this is where it helps having that figure sorted out first. Let's pull that up just a little bit. Perhaps we're going for a more contemporary shape here. And maybe she's wearing boots to protect her ankles and sort of woolen hose stockings in a kind of slightly sexy exposed skin way but also historical style rather than the contemporary uh, nylon stockings although if I wanted to we could go for nylon this again nothing stopping us Perhaps she's got a big glove on this arm, not so much on that arm. And then if that's the shape that I'm going for at the top, I once again would be editing what's going on up here. And then... Thinking of it more like a welding mask than sort of plague doctory. But if she's an alchemist, she's messing with all kinds of things. Where's a red face shape be? So yeah, almost like um, a bird skull style. That would be kind of cool. So yeah, that might take more development, but that's a kind of cool shape we've got going on there, bringing in some kind of um, plague-style face mask, which was an era-appropriate uh, thing. Uh, so yeah, we brought in a little bit more of a contemporary-ish feel, miniskirt style -y. Legs out, one arm. 
Again, maybe she doesn't want to do her alchemy. So exposed, but, you know, looks pretty cool. And had an idea. Oh, yeah. Now, I have done very historical fantasy style things going on here. And I'm now going to look at it maybe more from a sci-fi perspective, because it's one of the things I find in sci-fi is the designs they're very recycled. They're, you find very similar looks appearing across big sci-fi franchises, and they have this classic thing that looks science fiction-y. And then something like Firefly or Cowboy Bebop comes along, and you bring in maybe a more historical element. In Firefly's element, you're looking at Wild West, um, Victorian America, uh, either the big dresses or the gunslingers and stuff like that. Um, but there's no reason why you couldn't put medieval in space. Why not? So um, I didn't actually pick a character type for this. And I have a list somewhere of all the D&D &D classes. And I didn't really think what kind of space thing. Um, so, ooh, what would look kind of cool? Uh, ooh, there's all kinds of stuff. We've got strategists and uh, archers. Space archers would be pretty cool. Uh, classic soldier, shield bearer, space shields. We've got that in... Um, ooh, what's the... Black Panther, they had some amazing shields uh, using the cloaks. Um, Black Panther's a great way that they've pulled... Uh, African history into uh, science fiction styling. A great thing to look at for how they've done that. Um, cut purse thieves, uh, cat burglars, uh, John magicians and things. Um, I was classic adventurer, strategist thing going, going on in the middle. Um, let's go for strategist. We've got the person perhaps there not the captain, they're not in charge of the ship, but they're someone that's still kind of important. Um, and they make a lot of the decisions and advise the captain and the like, let's go for that. That will be fun. Um, now are we going for the masculine styling or the feminine styling? Because classic would be to go masculine uh, as many of our what we classify as gender neutral style things uh, are still very masculine heavy. So no, let's go feminine. So we're looking at something science fiction using the same shape. So perhaps more angular. So we'll stick with this conical shape to begin with. So we'll change her body into that. And I did say she was a strategist, but perhaps not military. We're looking at some kind of fun cargo thing. So if we pull up the straps of the shoulder, perhaps pulling them in a little bit, and maybe we've got something boxy instead of a chemise, you've got, you know, some kind of more solid space age thing going on. And perhaps that comes right up to the neck instead of a uh, chemise going up, you've got this kind of under garment structured going on. So perhaps she has computer styling and then perhaps she's wearing some kind of veil type thing going on like Italian Renaissance might. So maybe that's going down 
Uh, maybe not. Maybe we're going too soft on the material front. Although sci-fi can be, again, anything you like. That is very much the motto of what's going on here. Let's get some kind of neck situation going on. So we've got full of equipment and the like. Uh, I like um, Apple Watches are pretty sci-fi, so she's not wearing an Apple Watch specifically, but having some kind of accessory that ties her into stuff. And let's add some sort of seaming detail there. Uh, let's look at all these sleeves. And we haven't done much with these slashes. So let's go for that where we would have all of uh, wrong colour. Let's pick something tealish. So perhaps all of this is in a kind of teal tone and then some kind of steelish grey going on here and then like so so yeah this is where I have slightly less knowledge in the sense that I write uh, historical fantasy style things rather than uh, science fiction, but I am a huge science fiction fan and I just really wish people would get more creative with the costume styling because I'm fed up of seeing the same high-necked militaristic outfit. Now, high-necked might be interesting, but it's kind of dull. And I love, love me some asymmetry, so maybe we've got that going on there. We've got some gloves going on. Blue back out. Dark gloves. And then perhaps we've got a material that is more angular. So it's still got that folding from those box pleats. But it's, uh, it's not that typical pencil skirt or that very, very tiny skirt that you get in Star Trek. Because maybe this is more her personal choice of space fashion instead of a uniform because not everything needs to have a sort of crazy semi-militaristic thing going on especially in maybe a more civilian crew let's attach that to that and maybe that sits out there. So this is sort of reminiscent maybe of the more chain mail styles. And then oh, that's the wrong colour. We want black, not white. Let's hide that down the back. So we've got this cross over at the top, so maybe the skirt underneath is also crossed in mirror. And then let's keep this narrow leg going on. And again, shoes, because I think sci-fi, they wear boots a lot again, because, you know, boots are cool and sexy, and that's what producers like to portray in their television or film sci-fi. So perhaps we've got 
perhaps we've got some really cool shoes going on. And perhaps it exposes some kind of fun socks. Because you know the future's got to have some cool socks. So yeah, maybe that's too much of the history. So maybe we are going back to Star Trek with the thinner skirt style. Because the big one looked a little bit too clunky. And as we all know, from contemporary we do like hanging around in our leggings and our sweatpants rather than big clunky skirts although not all of us I'm wearing a massive skirt right now it's delightful yeah that looks a lot better and uh, bringing in this legging Yeah. So yeah, it's not quite the classic mini skirt of uh, Star Trek and it's not the pencil skirt or whatever other thing they tend to throw female officers in these kind of things into. Maybe, well that's a bit, uh, a bit Star Trek again. Uh, let's see. What have we got in these paintings going on with the hair? Covered hats, floppy hats, braided hair, French hoods. Oh, that's what's the French hood going to look like? A space French hood. <laughs> oh god, we're saving again. Yes, yeah, space French hood. There you go. Oh yeah, that's the right design, I think. Let's colour it in. And maybe she's got a dark veil or dark hair hanging out from it as well. So yeah, that's maybe a little bit more sci-fi, although I'm not fond of those. So as you can see, this part of the process is very um, scribbly. It's, uh, let's figure out the shape. I would always, the next step would be to lower the transparency and retrace it into something that makes more sense. Let's, let's go crazy. We all have some crazy hair. So yeah, that would be more sci-fi style, using the same basis. As I said, sci-fi is not necessarily my speciality, so I don't think like that as much, but it's still possible to take historical elements and throw them into any sort of made-up genre that you're playing with whether it's fantasy or sci-fi, space opera, etc, etc. Uh, you do see it in Star Wars. Um, they give some fantastic outfits to Leia and Padme and the like uh, that are history-based, but they're very strongly history-based, and it's not got the greatest visual cohesion. They jump around quite a lot. Um, but yeah, it's not impossible to start with this style of thing and take it to science fiction either. Um, so yeah, I'm going to leave it there. As I said, this was all from the late medieval period. And imagine what you can do when you combine something late medieval with something Victorian, with something contemporary. Um, as I showed with this mood board, this is contemporary fashion that's got a medieval twist. But there were so many other pieces of 
contemporary fashion uh, that could be taken and manipulated as well. Um, quite often when I'm doing this style of thing, I start off with a mood board that I'm looking for that specific outfit uh, and I will surround my image, my picture with those images so that I can keep referring to them. And in general, all these designs have similar-ish elements because they've all come from the same period of fashion history, but I'd like to think that I've got four unique designs. Um, and this might be something that you could use, uh, especially not including the sci-fi, but maybe the... Actually, it's, it's five designs I've made. Yeah, so maybe the first four that I made could potentially fit all in the same world because I've got the same source of inspiration. Um, but who knows? Uh, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy doing it. You may see some of these designs drawn up properly because I've drawn them now and I quite like them, but you might not. So yeah, uh, if you've made it this far, this is completely unedited. It's done as if it's the live stream. Hopefully I'll be able to get it up on YouTube soon-ish. And um, yeah, I hope you're all doing well. And I'm sorry that this couldn't have gone out live. Um, might try again later, but I'll definitely do another one of these videos, maybe uh, from another period of fashion history. Um, I will take requests on that. Uh, you may also submit questions on anything that I've done here uh, that you might want more clarification on, and I could maybe make another video of the like to help you guys out. Um, so yeah, bye.